Hello, everybody. Um, in this session, we will explore the trends that are shaping um, the e-commerce landscape, the latest trends, and we will have some interesting data to share. My name is Bianca Knerr. I'm with the Reverse Logistics Association, and I'm here with two absolute industry experts from DHL. So please let me introduce you to our speakers today. So first is Stuart Hill. Hello. Stuart comes from a retailer background. Um, so he was working or had also senior roles with uh, Asus, John Lewis and Farfetch and is now the CEO of DHL e-commerce UK. So he can, you know, take the options and, and, and shed light um, on, from both sides, from a buyer and a vendor and is, of course, a UK market expert. Want to say a few words about yourself, Stu? Yeah, um, so I've been at DHL now for three months uh, and it's a really interesting market for me, the UK at the moment. Lots happening, very competitive and I suppose coming from a retailer background, understand the challenges that are really happening in, uh, in the retail market today. So hopefully we can get into some of that detail in a bit. I'm sure we will. <laughs> and second, um, Alexander Schmitz-Hübsch. He is a, two decades, yeah, it's two decades experience in the logistics and CEP market in Europe and is now the senior vice president of DHL e-commerce. Want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, thanks. So um, I think most people are not able to pronounce my name that well. So thanks a lot. Well, good job here. Welcome to this great silent disco setup that we have here. I hope you enjoy it. And Team Green. Uh, yeah, great to be here. Um, 20 years, with, almost 20 years with DHL, as you just said. Um, first 10 years in, in consulting, uh, both um, you know within the in, within DHL, but also externally. In the last 10 years in the uh, yeah European cap market, and now responsible for um, uh, marketing and commercial at DHL e-commerce. Great to be here. Thanks, Alex. So let's get started. And one of the things we're talking today um, is uh, buying decisions, right? And the significant Im impact of uh, delivery options in that decision. So um, I want to get started with asking uh, two questions to our valued audience here. So first question, could you please raise your hand if you ever have bought something online? That looks like a solid 100% as expected, right? So speaking of myself, if I'm doing online shopping, I have a kind of an idea already how I want to get it. So the option I want you to get it delivered and when. And then I'm going online. I'm looking into um, different options, um, different paid, different websites. And then I find a product that I'd like. I put it into my uh, b um, basket and then I go to checkout. And then worst case scenario is I'm at the checkout point and I find out that option that I wanted to have and that I've already decided to is not there. So please raise your hand if that ever happened to you. No, Emma. Uh, please raise your hand if at that point you would just stop and start again. Yep. And that is what the results that you saw um, are kind of reflecting. That's about 50% of uh, online buyers who are not finding their preferred delivery option are abandoning their basket, right? So the question is, where do you have that data from? Yeah, so thanks, Bianca. So I think now for the third time in a row, we are doing uh, an online shopper survey. Um, why do we do that? Because, you know, personally, I think to be successful in this, we have to be work all together and have to be end to end right from the retailer via the carrier to the consumer, of course. And uh, that's why it's great to start with the consumer and what he thinks, what he or she needs, of course. And uh, it's now, yeah, it's a third time that we are going through these results now um, and starting getting a little bit into the topic, echoing what you just said. You see here on the slide uh, behind me, actually the influence on the left side, as you see here, of, that the, of the, the carrier has on the on the, dis the decision um, and the you know and the actual you know deal that's been made online is actually quite significant, as I'm sure Stu will echo in a second. But if you go through the numbers, right, 66% of the shoppers say they you know you know the delivery provider influenced the decision. 65% um, want to know who the delivery provider is. <clears throat> and 48%, to your point, will abandon their basket due to delivery options, and 39 would choose not to buy because of a certain delivery provider. Now, sometimes you just read these numbers, 
But if you think about it, I mean, if you get these 39 to 30%, right? I mean, how much more revenue would a retailer be able to be made, make? Yeah. So I think it's really an interesting number. Um, and uh, and of a lot of the frustration is driven then dri driven on what you see on the other side of the slide um, on delivery cost and delivery times and also having to be paid for returns. None of yeah, these are all not new, but of course we have to continue working on these, um, you know, jointly uh, to be as actually so that the retailers are able to sell more. And I think that would help everybody. Yeah? Thanks, Alex. And I, w I just want to say these numbers are not yet live, right? So you did that. So you do this survey on an annual basis, and this is the latest results. And we're just sharing, or Alex and Stu are sharing the latest results exclusively with you. It will be published soon, uh, but it is yeah very exclusively for you. So um, going back to uh, Stu, um, as a your customer experience, um, when you see these numbers. Are they surprising for you? Uh, no, I don't think they are surprising, actually. I think for me, when I look at these numbers um, and think about the retail market as a whole, and even as a consumer, um, and I think about my own shopping habits with, with Amazon, like, do I actually need my new kitchen spoon this afternoon? Probably not, but I tend to pick that button uh, on the website because it's there and available to us. Um, and I think for me, these results are really interesting when you compare it to like who are we as carriers competing against? And I think we're, we're seeing this merge between someone that is ordering a pizza um, via Deliveroo or Uber Eats and has got that real time triangulation of pizza themselves that are hungry and the, and the carrier. Um, so I just actually, I think what we are seeing is market trends change to be a lot more on demand driven. Um, and I think for me, if I sort of, was to double click in some of these numbers, I think we'll start to see the word convenience appear. Um, and as a retailer for the last 15 years, we have all been after speed at checkout. That's been our number one ambition. And I think somewhere in the last two years that has really pivoted into to convenience and speed has all of a sudden become a, a pillar of convenience. And, and as a shopper, um, actually, for myself, it will depend on what I'm buying and when I'm buying it. If I'm buying on a Friday, I might have a very different opinion of what I need as a delivery option than, than on a Monday. Um, so I think there's a lot behind these numbers that the survey can tell us around those trends evolving, merging into expectations and really convenience becoming part of the overall uh, thought process of a consumer. Can I ask a question to Stu? So when, when you were on the retailer side, were you discussing with your carriers about cart abandonment issues or more about on-time performance? Um, both. So I think w one of the real interesting elements for us um, as a retailer, as you say, it's this is about getting the mindset of a cat as a carrier out of net margin and a race to the bottom with, with penny war over parcels into actually that bottom number is about gross margin. If I can sell more, um, yes, I get a few more returns, but that's my gross margin element. And I think one of the big challenges the industry has had certainly in the UK, is that we as retailers talk to carriers about pennies on parcels, but don't actually realise that if we spend a bit more, we might actually get a bit more gross margin. I think that in the UK market has been a real trend over the last few, uh, I few agree. years. I agree. Thanks to you. Um, and Alex, from a carrier perspective, what's your response to that? Yeah, a lot. I think it's uh, just underlying, uh, you know, what we are trying to achieve and what we're working on day by day, which is to provide a reliable and affordable and sustainable service, right? And reliable means reliable towards the original expectation you are giving. It doesn't have to be tomorrow or within two hours. Just, you know, basically do what was promised. That's number one. But of course, also on the affordability side, I mean, the high delivery costs stand out here. Of course, the you know, everybody wants free shipping. That's clear. As a consumer, I want the same. Some, but somehow still there's cost to be involved. Um, but that's what we are investing in also, of course, in automation, everything from lockers, but also um, finding ways to, you know, um, you know, have more equal type of services to be, you know, because the speed is, a, is an interesting question here. So managing the trade off between the speed and the cost. Um, yeah. So I think that's uh, just under helping us to, you know, just underline we are on the right track here to drive these topics forward. I think one other thing just as a retailer and it'd be good to to see if my own experience as a retailer are the same no matter what you do at checkout um, you tend to find that the split between the cheaper option and the more expensive option is fairly standard and over the years yes 
things have got cheaper and we as retailers, I think, have created, and you've just mentioned it, Alex, there's no such thing as free shipping. It always costs. Um, and I think it's a pill that the retail environment has created. I remember many moons ago sitting in the ASOS boardroom talking about free delivery, and we thought it was a brilliant idea. Two years later, we couldn't backtrack. We'd offered that as a standard um, element. And I think in this retail environment, there's a big trend at the moment about Sunday delivery in the UK market. It's more expensive to a retailer, but generally the retailer wants to offer it to the same cost to the customer. And in this environment, can retailers sustain that, that investment? Um, so we're starting to see some of the retailers actually move back and drop the Sunday because that's one of the reasons they can start to hit their, their gross margin. And I think also that's one of the problems. I mean, you both know there is no free shipping. I mean, that's what is advertised to, to the consumer, but it's never for free. It's always in all the costs. So um, seeing these, uh, the slide is also um, the preferences um, a buyer has that are causing the frustrations if they're not met. If you have a, um, a frequent buyer, you might know these preferences already, right? So talking uh, into, um, let's say, AI, there are, in the meanwhile, we have the technology um, to use the data that we have from the customer. We know their preferences and could ease the frustration or avoid it. What do you think about that? Could AI help? So question to both of you. Could AI help um, to ease these frustration points? Uh, I believe yes. Um, I think actually as a consumer, it's about habits. And one of the great things about AI is it's a machine learning tool that can, that can create habits. And I think as a retailer, we used to do a lot of this analysis of what is the customer behavior on a Friday compared to a Monday. Um, now, I think because the checkout is such an important part of the retail journey and any latency in that checkout experience that slows it down costs you money. There is a real trade-off between building AI into checkout that is fast enough to give tangible delivery options to me personalized versus actually me waiting five seconds for that happen and, and getting distracted and, and not buying. So I think AI is definitely there. It's the speed at which that can be built into the checkout process that doesn't stop that conversion. That's, that's one of the key metrics as a retailer you measure on a daily basis. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And I think as a carrier, this then means we need to have these options available, right? And also support with the knowledge, the data points that we are collecting, I think, in this process uh, to ensure that, you know, the consumer has, you know, exactly what he or she needs in this process. And then I think uh, there's more, more sales coming. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, cool. And talking about these um, delivery options and preferences, what is the latest that you see there? So we see a lot of numbers on the following um, page about delivery preferences in Europe, different countries. Alex, can you quickly lead us through these numbers? What do we see here? Yeah, sure. As you said, it's a lot of numbers, but basically... <clears throat> We've been now, as I said, running this for the last uh, three years, so we see a little bit of movement. So if you look at the yellow bars on the on the on the slide here, um, the, especially on the left side, um, is is what the parcel locker uh, preferences, um, delivery preferences of consumers in Europe are. So basically, what would a consumer in Czech prefer as a last mile option? Uh, not saying this this is exactly the volume how it flows, but this is what the consumers think that they you know how they want it, um, and that made a big jump. Um, in, on the locker side in Czech, I mean, out of home was already big. The convenience stores, um, a little bit more on the right side already, was were quite accepted on around 30% um, as a preferred option, but the locker made, made a big step. So I think, in general, no surprise, but I think it underlines that out of home continues to be on the rise, for sure. Um, locker uh, goes up um, as well. Um, I mean, we all know Poland uh, is a very specific market in this case, but even that even more stronger with a 64% preference on the locker side. Um, uh, not a big surprise, but still an interesting number. Um, but also, if you look at it, that there are still countries where doorstep is absolutely the dominant, um, you know, uh, preferred option at least, um, and that includes countries like Germany, Netherlands, and the UK. Yep. As we talk about the UK, good to know. Um, so you as a UK market expert, what would you say about this? So someone's testing me because there's a big timer over the UK numbers there. So just looking at the, the numbers here. But um, I think for me, and again, this comes back to convenience. Um, 
When I think of lockers, I think of two things. One, C to C. I think in the C to C environment in the UK, um, we've just had a, a baby, 10 month old. I'm not sure we've actually bought something new for that, for my, my son in the last six months. So a lot of that is coming via uh, Vinted as an example. And I think as a C to C shopper, the locker boxes are super convenient. I, I've not got to go somewhere to collect um, or drop off the, the parcel. For me, locker boxes are convenient. And I think it comes back to this, um, the post-purchase experience, if I have selected that two to three day delivery um, at checkout and I'm expecting it on day two or three, if day two is a Friday and day three perhaps is a Monday, it may empower me to do something different while that, that, that parcel's in flight. Um, so I think this forms part of this overall um, convenience play and almost as carriers, how do we get to the point where we can empower a consumer to choose an option once that parcel's in flight? I think gone are the days where we just click the button at checkout, have standard and we're expecting it to arrive. It's how do we use these numbers to start to, uh, to leverage it. I think the one that I'm really surprised with is that 3% on the right hand side, the convenience store. Um, it would really suggest that we've got to the point where there are is market saturation on the shops that are willing to do that that collection point. Um, and I think there's a real challenge for us as carriers as to how do we make sure we balance the two. Um, if I think about the experience of, of shops, they've got closing times. Um, actually, those closing times can be quite inconsistent. Whereas a locker box, and certainly for my DHL e-commerce experience, there's only normally a certain size of parcel that I can fit into that, that box. So we've got to think about, it's not just the customer, it's actually what they're buying. And, does the item actually fit in the, lo the locker box itself? Mm. So I think there's a lot of data and algorithm that needs <coughs> to go behind this before we see expansion. Yeah, I would like to comment also one thing. I think when, when because you mentioned vintage or you know C to C type of um, uh, re-commerce <coughs> settings, um, I think what this also suggested because typically then people think locker to locker, <coughs> excuse me, or out of home to out of home relations, and of course that's you know makes sense. And because the if you buy something for eight or ten euros or, or pounds, then of course the transaction can't be eight pounds or five pounds or whatever. So I think that that's clear. But I think <coughs> what this suggests and what we also see in other markets, um, it could be maybe dropped in a locker, but then it'd be de still delivered to a doorstep. So I think what I'm trying to get at, this also suggests, and we see this in some markets, that even C to C re-commerce is not exactly the same in each market, right? So um, I think that, so I would not yet say that doorstep is is, uh, is done, right? Yeah. So <laughs> and, and Alex and I were talking earlier, I think one of the big elements for me and an unknown, and I would suspect this isn't just from the UK, is I can't believe that local councils are not going to put a restriction on locker boxes at some point. We're, we can't in the UK have an environment where there is a locker box everywhere. Um, in the UK, to put a locker box in front of a shop, you need planning permission. And therefore, there's going to be bureaucracy that will get to a point where it's difficult to, uh, to spread these boxes. And actually, I think some of these numbers we might see to s start to slow down, not because of the will not to do it, but we're starting to hit the locations that are a lot more complicated to, to get there. These are also the regional differences that we see because of the yeah, environment that we have in the specific countries, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So from a carrier perspective, again, um, what is your response and strategy for out of home? Yeah, I think we are um, out of home believers for a long time, <laughs> um, investing into it. Um, uh, when it comes to the European landscape, we have now um, connected 140,000 access points um, all across Europe on one standard. Uh, of course, with a lot of partners, um, but I think that's really a great asset that we are using and we have been building to, you know, enable everything from, you know, a delivery to an access point or out of home point, um, but also, um, you know, of course, returns and, and not at home processes. Um, and in, in our core markets, we're also heavily investing into automation. Uh, so locker buildups in uh, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, um, Italy. So, uh, yeah, I think it's supporting us in, you know, uh, you know, following our strategy. So just one question to both of you. How do you think that will develop in the future? Will we see a further rise in out of home or especially for the different countries? I mean, will we have, let's say in UK, I mean, that's a different market. So you say already reached kind of a, a density that's possible. But let's say Germany, 
Um, will we reach a, a number that's uh, comparable with Poland at one point? Or do you think that? I think from the UK market, it's more of a slowdown. I'm not sure we've reached the saturation point. Um, I think the big thing for me in the UK in a B2C environment, different to a C2C, is actually as a retailer, I'm going to put my retailer hat on. One, um, I want to show the consumer where that locker box is because that's the convenience bit. Now, ultimately, I'm not going to get that to that locker box in the next two hours and therefore there is a chance tomorrow that locker box is full and I think this cycle of convenience and service if we get to the saturation point where actually as a customer I'm getting there my parcel's not there because there's not enough space that's quite an interesting dilemma that I think uh, we've got in the UK and as a retailer I want to inform my customer at checkout and I think that's the leap that we need to uh, we need to take. As a carrier, I think there's a really interesting dynamic here around the saturation point where I can get to the cost to make that work for the retailer. Um, and actually, I need a drop density to that locker box to get to the price point that we need to make it competitive and not more expensive or the same as a, uh, as a home retailer. So I think those are the two things that we're wrestling with, one from a retailer standpoint and one from a carrier standpoint. Yeah, I definitely the journey's not over. I would say, um, again, markets have different saturation, as you see here, or as we all know, actually. But I think if you go through the different markets in, in Europe, I don't think it's we are fully at an equilibrium, for sure. Um, and I also think it will remain dynamic. So, um, you know, these, these ideas are not new, but now f people have built the first mobile pack station that's been driving around, uh, you know, be because at one time maybe space is limited. So maybe then you to have excess capacity, you put a mobile pack station at another supermarket um, just next to the fixed build locker you next to it as a on the parking lot uh, so i think you know there's a lot of innovation still which i think is great i think it's only good for the consumer for us and as an industry so i think we should watch the space for sure yeah and being in the logistics space you need to be flexible anyways right so keep an eye on the data um, as we talk about the differences in these uh, countries probably let's also talk about international hurdles so differences between countries like ordering in another country mm -hmm. Very nice. So, Alex, maybe you can tell us what we see here. Yeah. So as part of the online shopper survey, we ask a lot about also about international uh, trade. Um, so nothing we can, you know, show here because that would be <laughs> would, would be an own session in itself, uh, maybe for next time. But just to have the discussion around it. And of course, the, the results will be shared over time, um, you know, with, with everybody. Um, you know, first of all, I mean, international um, cross-border business is 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 a is a is a standard right i think it but i was reflecting on it maybe 10 years ago it was still a little bit more of an alien still i mean neighboring countries yes but i think it came a long way and today it's just absolutely normal and the question here was um, do you buy from online shopping sites based in other countries 56 percent say yes i think we all know the reality is probably in terms of where the volume comes from is probably 80 percent from somewhere else because the consumer often doesn't even know where it comes from right so the international flows are, are clear um, and we see a lot of growth, um, all of us, I guess, um, intra-Europe, uh, you know, China into Europe, Turkey into Europe. So I think there's a lot of potential uh, that we are all following, which is great. Um, but there are still hurdles. <clears throat> and um, I think th the question that was asked, why don't you buy from online shops based in different countries? It's a pretty strong question. Don't buy, right? Um, so, and it's, again, not surprising, but still it's a strong um, fear of fraud. Um, long delivery times and customs charges. And again, I think if we can, there's never a silver bullet, but step-by-step -step improvements here. And the more we do that, again, we unlock more potential. So that's why uh, we look into these things and see how we can, you know, jointly, uh, you know, improve it. So probably let's go through the at least top ones. I mean, fear of fraud, 46%. Um, Stu, from your experience, can you relate to that? Uh, yeah, I think I can. I, I think interestingly your eyes do go to that right hands of the graph I think importantly on the left hand side there's more customers saying they will i would guess and haven't had the chance to deep dive in the data that that age has got a large part to play in that i think as a retailer we certainly see our older customers are uh, uh, more reluctant to to buy uh, overseas and the reason i mentioned that i think that fear of fraud piece is just inherent i'm not sure there's anything as a retailer that we do that that is there it's just uh it, it's a bit of an, an inherent one i think the interesting one as a retail when we look at fraud it actually can encompass lots of things um 
And actually, if you think about a parcel getting lost or stolen, a consumer can often view that as fraud rather than the website I'm shopping from isn't right. um, isn't one that I, I, I trust as a whole. But but absolutely, um, I think one of the interesting elements and developments for me in cross border is the whole chargeback piece. Um, as a consumer, I've got great comfort in my credit card giving me the option to do a chargeback. As a retailer, it's a bloody nightmare because the I couldn't, as a carrier, can't give as much information to that, that retailer that stops them getting the chargeback. And certainly in the luxury sector, chargeback was coming a real issue because a customer could ask the question and just get their, uh, get their money back. So I think there's a lot within that fraud bucket that, again, if we double clicked on, we'd find quite an interesting result. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and I need, of course, to ask more questions about the fraud topic. So I have also some background in a uh, international uh, retailer um, company and was uh, doing trainings in, in, in fraud. Uh, so I, I like what you said. For a customer, it, 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 there is no differentiation. What is fraud? It can even be like the, the parcel it did not arrive. It's fraud. So it's more of an emotion. Absolutely. Um, so, but knowing that, how could, Do you have any ideas how to ease that to to make them you know to help them not fearing this? Yeah, I think it's um, again as a retailer for me, any information you can give within the purchase experience is is good for the uh, consumer. And um, if you think about even customs charges, because I think there is an overlap between the two, it's there's a customs charge I'm not used to paying. That is this fraud. Um, I think anything we can do to pull out um, costs delivery within the PDP pages, the, the product page and not checkout, actually really helps this, uh, this journey. And I think as a carrier, we now can really empower the retailers via data to make sure that the customer sees everything at the product page and not at the checkout. And I think that's a real challenge for us within the data to get it accurate because the retailer doesn't want to be exposed in terms of the, uh, the cost. So I think pushing all the information into the product pages for me is one of the ways that we can tackle that, that fraud element. It's also about building trust, Absolutely. right? And, yeah. Okay, uh, going to the second point, longer delivery times. That's one for you, Alex, I think. How could DHL help here, your take? Yeah, I, it's an interesting one. And it's, it's actually surprising because I, I think that overall we came, again, the industry came a pretty long way here. So um, first of all, of course, there's always express options that, you know, DHL and others have in, you know, uh, available um, and which are used. And I think, again, in a, in a proper checkout process, also good to have these options specifically if we talk uh, international uh, shipping. Um, but also still the European arena, parcel delivery, uh, the, the, I think the quality and speed has increased a lot over the last couple of years from, you know, it's e many, you know, retailers easily have a one to three day type of promise, um, you know, even in a pan-European supply chain setup. Um, but I think there's more than that, which goes again more into the supply chain setup where there's additional um, capabilities available, a little bit less from a parcel perspective, more from supply chain uh, perspective, um, you know, forward stock locations. Um, our colleagues from DHL supply chain have great solutions for that. Um, easy to integrate in the, um, in, the, in the supply chain, but also things like drop shipping and so on. So I think the closer we get, obviously to the to the to the to the heart of the consumption and i think there's models that can support that i think then over time i assume this will be will go should go down actually i expect so too um custom charges i'm i'm promising i'm not doing any brexit jokes <laughs> um so but that's definitely one for you when we talk about the uk right so um as the ceo of uh, dhl parcel uk you are quite familiar with customs, right? And the problems and the challenges that are coming up with that. So how can retailers and carriers help customers to overcome them? Yeah, I think, mm, to be honest, I think this one, it was a Brit, I feel like I've got to apologize for Brexit many Thank years Thank you. On. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure when that will stop. Um, this one for me, and I could probably talk about this for hours, but for me, customs charges uh, are really, really emotive on both sides. One is an absolute barrier for a customer. Um, If you are displaying it at checkout, it looks more expensive and you come back to that, is it fraud? And it touches on so many things. It's often a surprise to the customer because they go through all that shopping process and see it at checkout because it isn't included in the, in the prices. But then as a, as a carrier, um, it's, it's a mandatory thing we have to do. And if you look at even the complex of returns process, there are, um, there's paperwork that we need to fill in to get something back. As a retailer, 
this customs charge one is a is a massive issue because I think there's a lot of sunk cost that goes into duties aren't often um, recoverable when it comes back to a, a, a return parcel and if we as a carrier start to think about how we can help retailers it really is facilitating things like duty drawback it's making sure that the date is in a way that a retailer can make advantage of things like RGR, um, preference, etc. Um, and I don't think the carrier industry, one of the reasons why I actually took this job, I don't think the carrier industry has, um, has quite got there. And this is a massive opportunity for us as DHL to start to help facilitate that for, uh, for retailers, because this is a gross margin impact that we can't avoid as a, as a retailer in the market. Yeah, completely agree. And as you talked about returns, I'm in now, so yeah, that's my part. <laughs> Let's talk about returns in Europe. So again, we see a few numbers. Alex, can you lead us through? Yeah, look, um, so two questions of the many questions we ask around returns we brought here just to have this discussion around it. Um, 38% um, of the consumers buy only from shops where their returns are for free. Um, um, I think Stu and I talked about it. That's maybe a little bit of a self-made problem also, as you said. Um, so yeah, I think th what this suggests, obviously, that there's still the, the, you know, the, the interest or the willingness to pay for returns is still quite limited. And also I found interesting that in terms of um, how these flow back, um, how, how, how you want to, the process be organized as a consumer, that a large chunk, um, still almost two thirds, 63 percent, still prefer just the return label included. And uh, I, I personally don't think it's a big surprise um, because it's just simple, right? It's in there, put it on, shit the box out. Uh, but I would have expected that everything around labelless or QR code is is, uh, is is already has risen more. We invest a lot in this, also internationally, to have QR code uh, returns um, enabled. But uh, yeah, so I think the consumer uh, still in the majority wants free returns and very easy returns. Not a surprise, but I would have expected a little bit more change after the last couple of years because a lot of retailers, uh, you know, have been playing around with this and also push back a little bit, right? Yeah, I think in the UK, we've seen the retail market, it's a real dilemma, do I charge for returns or not? And we've seen a real change in the number of retailers that are now starting to, to charge for returns. Um, the one thing that jumps out for me on this slide is the, the contradiction between the two graphs, which is actually, if I'm going to offer free returns, as a retailer, I generally want to then manage the cost and to manage the cost, I probably need a customer coming to a portal where I can manage that flow, understand what they're returning. I don't have a crystal ball. Are they returning all of it? Are they returning some of it? Um, so I think there's a real clash that will happen as this starts to evolve where the control for a retailer needs to be in that return label. Um, and I can't offer choice if I'm putting a label in a box. Um, I can't even predict what the customer's returning and therefore can't optimize the cost. So I think actually, if anything, we're going to see this um, start to almost come a bit more polar in uh, as things develop. Yeah, and I, I think that's, sorry for that, but it's very interesting. It's your home um, turf, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and we as Reverse, uh, Reverse Logistics Association, we have retailers, manufacturers and service providers in our association. And the perception of returns is completely different depending on which uh, pillar you're um, uh, talking to. So, Stu, you have both views. You, you've been uh, on, the, on the retailer side and now you're on the logistics side. Um, you already said, uh, interesting enough, um, the retailer just looks at it as how can we reduce the cost? So it's already, it's negative. It is negative. It will, there will be costs. And the only question is how can we, you know, make the best out of the bad situation? Um, now you're on the logistics side. You probably see it from a different angle because... I love returns. Returns are exactly. great. Exactly. <laughs> That's how you can make money, right? Yeah, it is. I think, but I think there is a there's an element where a return is overlapped with the service we provide. If we are late on the delivery, the chances of a customer returning is a lot higher. Um, and that's where I think we do have this. Um, we want our retailers to be successful. If they're not making money, then they can't give us parcels. So I think we do have a massive part to play in doing that in a way that's that's right. I think there is a friction. As a, as a retailer, cost isn't just about what I'm paying the carrier, it's if I can get my returns rate from 
30% to 28%, that's got a real cost benefit um, uh, to me. So I think that's where the service element and the choice and convenience in delivery could help this whole overall perception of returns costs and not just the cost of the parcel. Yeah, good and good point. Um, so Alex, how can a carrier make it affordable? It's not that it's not affordable, but I think the question, how can we make it more affordable, right? Um, and again, that, don't think it's a silver bullet, but I think, first of all, automation. So again, the lockers in the first mile, I think, will help. Then, of course, the scaling of the lockers in the first mile will be helped because, of course, the more we use the asset, I think the more there's uh, options to, you know, provide more affordable service. Um, but also in the flow back, um, for, for example, internationally, um, we have build the opportunity to do something like let's call it a reverse mother boxing yeah so not not opening the box but you know the the um uh, the individual return flow but at least putting it in a into a mother box and then shipping it back so like consolidating shipments uh, at certain points so we we're working here together our colleagues from supply chain um yeah so there's these things and then also one thing i want to mention what we also do try to do a lot is you know talk with our customers about the differences per market um, because if you and your market used a return quota of 10-15% and you're selling, let's say, to Germany, where the fashion return quota can be 40-50% and you just don't know this, then you're selling great in October, but in November you are out of cash. Uh, because because you, you don't expect all these returns. So I think there's a lot of still education and that's also part of affordability, right? So that we uh, really jointly work on this topic and enable what you just said. So this, this, this visibility, what's really in the box, I think is really important. So I think, the, of course, we have tools here, retailers also, um, because that then helps us, everybody, to decide where this return should go. Yeah, I think that's also a very important element, what you actually then do with the return. I think we could do a whole session just around that. Absolutely. Hope we can do that in the Happy future. Happy to come to one of your events. <laughs> yeah, we'll need to talk about that in two weeks in Amsterdam, guys. Um, but just to close the returns topic, um, we've talked about the money. The other side is sustainability, circular economy. Of course, the returns are a big part of that. So question to both of you, what can be done there? Uh, I think for me, as a retailer, I want to know what's in that box as early as I possibly can. And actually, if I can intercept that box, one, it's more sustainable because if I'm selling internationally, I'm not sending something from the UK to uh, the US and back. And therefore, actually, if I can fulfill from country, if the product is damaged and I've got re-love, reusable um, sites. So I think, again, it's this convenience within the chain and the ability to, to push a parcel to a different location. It would just stop the stem mileage of that parcel being as much as it is and that's the first step to me to be a more sustainable yeah yeah agree so i think it's uh, t exactly two things one is we can make the process greener um so you know battery powered solar powered um lockers um you know electric vehicles that pick it up certified buildings so th obviously the reverse of the delivery process all green i think that's what we all work on um that's number one uh, in terms of um, sustainability and then of yeah i think the most important thing we had great discussions here also uh, during this conference about these concepts moving the goods only short distance and you know there's other service providers who then maybe resell them to somewhere else ideally also in short proximity so i think these things are i'm sure as i'm sure you're aware from your background uh, i think what we should do um if it if the supply chain flow is allowed allows it absolutely so then let's move to our last topic because I think uh, we don't have so much time left. Um, and that's a fun one for you, Alex, right? Yeah. So Talk about subscriptions and that's something you really like, obviously. Yeah, bear with me for just two more minutes because why is this a little bit of a personal pet topic um, in subscriptions? First of all, maybe who of you guys is having a um general e-commerce subscription so something that you get on a like once a month or once a week um yeah so yeah that, that's a, that's kind of a quarter so it kind of makes sense what we also as part of this analysis here or the data we captured this is a lot bigger in other parts of the world yeah so asia even us and why i think is this interesting first of all i'm always intrigued on clothing um a subscription i mean i know there's this fancy stuff i don't know what this is socks i don't know so there's underwear. all sorts of interesting underwear all sorts of interesting models but joke aside um what, why i think is, is this interesting if we could increase the share of subscription of what we ship we could be 
ease at least a little bit some of the issues that our industry has, which is very volatile volumes, because this is very predictable, right? Uh, and this is why I think it's an interesting, interesting thing, at least from a logistics perspective, to flatten the bullwhip effect a little bit, right? Um, but not sure how interesting, or maybe still with your retailer head, this is, right? Um, yeah, um, absolutely. And I think if you think about the, the previous subjects, I mean, some of the brands that are now, you can buy a, a box of end of life clothes, right? There's some really interesting subscription models are, are coming up. But as you say, anything that helps me predict as a retailer and a carrier to flatten that, that curve has got to be a good thing. It manages cost, it's, it's good for service, 100%. Definitely. And let me close with a personal question to Stu. Which subscription model um, models do you have? So I, I was looking along that list. I think I've got one of everything. Oh yeah. Um, what I would say is uh, which beverages are you preferring? <laughs> <laughs> I just have they're here because I love the brand. But who gives a crap? Um, I forgot to turn the uh, subscription off, and I've worked out it takes a hell of a long time to get through 146 rolls of toilet paper. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's my experience. <laughs> So thank you both. There were a lot of very, very interesting insights and I can't wait that this uh, report is published. It will be soon, right? Yeah. yeah okay. So we'll be uh, to, for, ready for download on the uh, DHL website. And uh, Stu and Alex will be available for you. They have a booth. Uh, you might have seen it. It's quite big one in the front. Um, they're available for chat and uh, questions if you want to just step over there. Um, my myself, of course, too. So thank you for listening and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.